I am Rosanna Lockwood. You're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. This is Prime Time, where we bring you all the stories that matter. On the show tonight, businesses crippled by crime and drug misuse, showing no sign of slowing down. We're asking, can anyone make Britain's streets safe again? Divers battle poor visibility, searching for missing mother Gaynor Lord in a river as police try to piece together her last known movements. We'll be live in Norwich, where the hunt has entered its seventh day. And Argentina's new president, Javier Millet, takes a chainsaw to the economy. We'll look at why the world might want to pay more attention to El Loco's economics. Plus, we'll bring you our lightly panel, looking at other stories making headlines today with commentators Jana Jarchu and Alex Steen. This is Prime Time. Well, the most basic job of a government is to keep its population safe, isn't it? We vote, we pay our taxes, we follow the laws, and we expect, in turn, that the government will keep its end of the bargain. But how do you feel that's working at the moment? That if you report a crime, do you feel like you'll see some justice? Or even that the organisations meant to keep us safe really care? Tonight, we'll dive into Britain's law and order problem. We're going to ask who really has the answers. Some stats out today showing 3.1 million Brits, that's nearly 10% of the population, are using drugs. That is 17% higher than a decade ago and holding steady. More than a million of those users take Class A drugs like cocaine. While under the surface, reports of synthetic opioids similar to those devastating in the US are making their way here too. Then there are the businesses so crippled by crime that they're considering closing. Over 4 million small firms in England and Wales say they've been hit by at least one crime over the last two years. One in ten lost more than £10,000 to it. Their staff are being threatened, their stores ransacked on a daily basis. And of those who report it to the police, more than half say officers don't even bother to turn up. While for those who do get the police, to take it seriously, the number of those actually charged with an offence or handed a summons has been dropping like a stone for years, now down to just 6% from shops being openly looted in broad daylight to an increase in fraud, knife crime and drug use, there is a sense of lawlessness about Britain today. A sense not just that crime is getting worse, but that criminals are getting away with it. No wonder crimes aren't being reported. For those who do get to see an offender prosecuted, the wait is far, far too long. The Crown Court backlog in England and Wales stands at its highest level on record with nearly 67,000 cases waiting to be dealt with. Prisoners are, so, prisoners are so overcrowded that offenders are being pushed out early. In London, Mayor Sadiq Khan is accused of wasting more time on Eulers than on cutting violent crime. And for the country at large, what of the party law and order? In power, in number 10 Downing Street, for the past 13 years, Rishi Sunak has promised, of course he's not been there 13 years, but just the last few, to keep the public safe. Just today, announcing another £800 million in funding to do just that. But isn't it the Conservatives' fault that we are in this mess? Police were cut for almost a decade before we ended up in this situation. Justice was defanged and defunded. And the Home Office says that since 2010, our communities are safer. So why doesn't it feel like it? And how do we fix it? Former Police Officer Norman Brennan joining me now. Norman, thanks so much for joining us. Do you think... What I just said there. Do you think that's a fair summary of the situation in Britain at the moment? It's been a fair summary of Britain for the last 10, 12 years. Uh, if you want me to be blunt, the criminal justice system is broken. And if a criminal justice system is broken, you've actually got to look at what the solutions are, what the prognosis is. And you, you hit upon it just now. About 12 years ago, uh, the government um, crippled policing by 22,000 serving frontline officers and tens of thousands of backroom staff. As a result of that, you had less police officers doing more, plus backfilling. And it was then, if you want to know the truth, when policing lost the streets, because when there were no police on the streets, the criminals have taken advantage. And the sad reality is, the policing have never caught up with what's gone wrong. And if you want to know the answer before we actually start looking for the solutions. We need 20,000 more on top of the 20,000 we lost that we've just got back to retake the streets because at the moment the police, I'm afraid, are not on the streets and they've not just losing the battle, they've all but lost it. So police on the streets, Bobby on the beat if we use that term, but that really makes a difference, having that visible presence. Well, it does. Um, I've been in law and order now for 45 years, 31 as a front year, frontline police officer. 
when I joined the police service and they call me a, a, an old dinosaur or whatever, but we had respect, moral fiber, we had community spirit. People gelled. We now have a divided nation. We have so much anger and hatred, belligerence, division and revenge. And unfortunately, the police have got the brunt of it. So we don't see the police on the street. The public don't feel reassured. Shopkeepers, which you're going to come on to, don't feel protected or reassured. And the criminal element are having a field day. When I joined the police service quite a while ago now, they said crime doesn't pay. I have never seen crime pay so well and I've never seen a criminal justice system so ineffective to actually deal with it. And where does that leave us? Talk to us a little bit about the types of crime, because shop, shops is one thing. Shoplifting is something we've looked at quite a lot on this show. Um, people are worried about knife crime as well, petty crimes, you know, theft of bicycles, home burglaries, and also much more serious crimes as well. I mean, in terms of where we're at, at the moment, the pattern of the types of crimes you see, what most concerns you? Well, my specialist subject is homicide, gun and knife crime. Um, about uh, 37, 38 years ago, I broke from the ranks within policing because I was stabbed, very seriously injured, nearly lost my life, and I saw my colleagues being stabbed. I saw the victims being stabbed, and nobody cared about us. There was lots of help for the offenders, etc. And I then looked at the future, and I predicted back then, dozens of newspaper headlines there, and I said, unless we get a grip on knife crime, it will become an epidemic. Well, what do you report on all the time? So we've got gun crime, we've got knife crime, we've got um, robberies, stalking, GBH, we've got vehicle theft, cycle theft. Whatever crime you highlight or the news highlights on a daily basis and you get told, we will crack down on this, I am telling you, there are so many crackdowns that we've cracked down on nothing. It's a bit like when everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. And at this moment in time, police officers are leaving in their droves. The public, some of them are frightened to walk the streets, travel on transport. And our courts, our criminal justice system, instead of being fair and unbiased, they've become social workers and victims of crime, the people that look to the courts to protect them, feel as though they're incidental to the criminal justice system. And my position is unique in Britain, is I'm an independent voice on policing. Victims of crime, I have a passion for it, and the public protection. I've advised them on the law, what needs to be done, what should be done and what isn't being done. And I'm sitting in front of you now and I've done thousands of interviews over 35 years. And unless we actually invest in a criminal justice system, unless we've got a courts and magistrates and judges that actually effectively punish, I'm afraid the only people that are laughing are the criminals. And a caveat to your theft at the moment, I got a call yesterday or certainly a message yesterday from an undercover detective, retail detective, and she said to me, I work at a very mm. big retail store. She said, most of the stuff that's nicked is high value stuff, not milk, not sandwiches, not stuff that somebody might need to just to survive. And they said, just across the road from us is a hotel. And she said, it's full of Albanians and others. And first thing in the morning, they come across the bridge and they wait outside. And that store probably loses hundreds, if not tens of thousands of uh, items of goods every year. And shoplifting is out of control. Mm. Shopkeepers can't look to the police to protect them because the police are not protecting. So some of them are going under. Mm. And when the police turn up, they say to me, Norman, they say, we know the courts are not going to take it seriously and neither we are. And the very final point is, only five weeks ago, I detained a shoplifter. I pursued them in my motor vehicle. They were nicked after hiding in an industrial estate. Mm. I'm an advanced driver. I went down a no entry sign. I was on to Scotland Yard, 999. They were rushing officers to my assistance. They thanked me. The guy was nicked when all the officers turned up. I went back having spent three hours doing that. From Richmond Council, I got a fixed penalty ticket, oh, no, which has just gone up to 130. Now, if that's what happens to someone yeah. who's a retired police officer, yeah. an advanced driver, I'm used to following people, looking to see who's on the pavement in the road. Nobody was put at risk, and it was such a terse response. So it's now going to go to I the... I hope you're appealing that. I am, and it's going to go to the chief executive. But if that's what happens to someone like me, what hope have the public got when they don't see the police, they don't feel the criminal justice system supports us, and all they see is the government talking about 
immigration, talking about all the issues that don't concern them, the things that hurt the public, are being ignored. And the public have all been given up. And the reason why nobody does anything about it, the law-abiding public, the silent majority, remain silent because they don't think anyone cares anymore. What an indictment of our criminal justice system. Norman Brennan, former police officer, we really appreciate your thoughts this evening. We're actually going to talk a little bit more now about the government response to this and go across to Anthony Stansfeld, who's the first Conservative Thames Valley Police and Crimes Commissioner. Uh, thank you for making time, sir. Uh, you were elected just over 10 years ago. The Home Office says Britain is safer now than 10 years ago. Do you agree? Um, no, I don't. Um, I, I, I agree with Norman Brennan. I think we have a real problem at the moment. And it largely goes back to when Theresa May was the Home Secretary. Um, and the police cuts were savage. Uh, you said, I think, 18%. In fact, the government grant to policing was cut by 30%. Um, we had to make up a bit from the local council, through council tax, to make it up. But we lost a huge number of our most experienced officers. At that time, they were made redundant at huge expense. And the actual police force um, left was far less experienced, and we were being directed more and more to set, being social service workers. I mean, at lunchtime on Friday, most of the NHS went home. The police were having to deal with all the mental problems over the weekend. It was tying up a huge number of police officers and, and at great expense. And I think we also lost a great deal of the intelligence we had on criminal gangs with our senior officers leaving. So uh, it stemmed, uh, it was really in about, I think the cuts were about 2014, 2015, when we were absolutely decimated. And I don't think we've recovered from that. Um, I do give, I had a meeting once with Boris Johnson before he became prime minister, about three weeks before he became prime minister. And he said to me, we will make good the loss. And he was true to his word. We reinstated 20,000 police officers. But of course, they were all recruits, and it takes about three years, four years to get them even remotely experienced. And we're suffering from that to this day. So policing has been left, I think, in a very poor shape. And I also think things like the College of Policing have been incredibly weak. I think we've produced a generation of police officers who seem to have taken degrees in wakeness rather than sorting out crime. So there is a problem, and I agree with Norman Brennan. Some quick stats. Yeah, Norman would actually like to join back in this conversation just quickly, Anthony. He's got some stats he wants to share with us. In the last, in the last few years, we've re-recruited re 20,000 police officers. It's almost like a burglar giving back what they've taken over a long period of time. Out of those 20,000, 4,500 police officers have already resigned and jumped ship. And when you look at police officers, the types of crimes they have to tackle, knife crime, which is my expertise, 37,000 knives were seized off the streets of uh, Britain over the last 12 to 15 months. Every one of those was a potential killer. And my passion is this, is that children are killing children. Parents are planning funerals instead of bright futures. When did that ever become right? And for the first time in 35 years, I've got a meeting with the Home Secretary in two and a half, three weeks' time, and I'm going to put myself forward, just a normal member of the public, with passion, vision and direction and ability to understand what needs to be done. And I'm going to ask to be Britain's Homicide Gun and Knife Commissioner. And for the first time, you're going to have someone who's got a wealth of experience, has been stabbed, nearly died, understands the psychology, has been on the streets, grew up in care, saw people's broken lives, but someone that actually represents the public, listens to them, feels their pain, shares their pain, but knows what needs to be done. Let's see in three weeks' time if you can have someone that can jump up on that stallion with an ability to see what needs to be done and put together a one, three, five, seven and ten year plan. Nobody's mm. ever pulled all the shreds or sh the, the shards together on gun and knife crime. And once we do that and parents stop planning funerals instead of futures, that'll be the day that I think somebody's done something positive for a change. Norman, thank you for sharing that. Um, just before we wrap up, I want to come back to you, Anthony, and just say you were just listening to that. Do you think that's a good idea, a gun, knife and homicide commissioner? Well, I think we have to be careful. We seem to have commissars for everything. 
these days, but I think possibly Norman Brennan might do the job. Um, we certainly need something to be sorted out. And one of the things we haven't mentioned, which is out of control completely, is major fraud at the moment. I mean, the banking frauds and everything are on a colossal level, and absolutely nothing is done with it. And our regulatory authorities are totally inadequate at the moment. The Financial Conduct Authority and the National Crime Agency um, seem to be absolutely hopeless. They collude with each other, they close down major crimes. There is an awful lot wrong in the system at the moment, I'm afraid. We need to start loving our police because once we love the police, I'm sure that they're going to start seeing that the police really are the people's friends. And that's another point that I want to push forward in the future because if the police and the public are not working together, what chance have we got of building Re-Britain? Norman Brennan, Anthony Stansfield. Gentlemen, thank you very much. It's been fascinating. Next here on Primetime, we'll bring you the latest in the search for missing mother of three from Norwich, Gaynor Lord. Stay with us. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking to the limit. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegan's about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you discussion can't, can you? You? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back. You're watching Primetime with me, Rosanna Lockwood. Now, fears are growing for the whereabouts of a missing mother of three from Norwich after specialist dive teams search a river almost a week after she first disappeared. 55-year-old Gaynor Lord vanished after leaving work early last Friday. This CCTV footage is the final sighting of her before belongings were later found by a river in a nearby park. 
At the moment the CCTV is telling us that she, she left work and she made her way over a period of time to the river where she was seen. Nobody's seen her go into the river, nobody's seen her into the water, but we know that she ended up in the park. At the moment there's nothing else that the CCTV is showing us about who she may have spoken to, any interactions she, she might have had. It's literally the journey that you've seen so far that we put out. Well, in that press conference today, Norfolk Police said Gaynor Lord's behaviour was out of character on the day she disappeared, giving detectives more questions to answer. Joining me live from Norwich tonight, Talk TV correspondent Nick Ellaby, who's been on this story all day. Nick, tell us what you've learned broadly. What's the latest? Good evening, Rosanna. Well, the police are kind of focusing their search on, on two real areas. We've got the River Wensum that you mentioned in the city centre that goes through that park, Wensum Park, with the last known sighting of Gaynor around 4pm on, on Friday evening where her clothes were found, also her handbag, telephone, jewellery as well. And the police tell me that they're concentrating their search on that part of the river. We've seen over the last two days specialist dive teams painstakingly going through inch by inch about a 50 metre section of the river and the police are telling us that that search could go on for days. Visibility is very poor, the river's swollen, that's made it difficult over the last few days. Visibility is between zero metres and four metres, so it's taking them a long, long time and, and, and could take them a long time further as well. Another interesting thing I learned speaking to people who know Gaynor is that she knows that park very well. She used to go bathing there as a young lady, as a young girl. And it's an area where lots of people used to go bathing in the 70s, 80s and, and even the 90s as well. So has a, a connection in, in her memory. And then in terms of piecing together that final journey, you mentioned the CCTV footage. We know Gaynor Lord left work where she works as a retail assistant for, for um, Bullard's Gin at Gerald's Department Centre, just a few hundred metres down here. We know she left there about 2.45 on Friday afternoon, made her way along here. Queen Street here and then towards the cathedral grounds there's a footage of her actually rushing through the city centre and on this junction just behind me she almost gets hit by a car outside the pub and then she makes her way into the cathedral grounds and the police are particularly keen to find out about the 30 minute window when she was inside the cathedral grounds she then came out again and headed to the park and the police are appealing for anyone with more information. They've spoken to some 30 people who uh, report possibly a sighting of Gaynor on Friday afternoon and Friday evening. But what they're trying to do is piece together a bit more information. Detective uh, Chief Superintendent Dave Buckley, who I spoke to today from Norfolk Police, said he's fairly confident that Gaynor did not physically, personally meet anyone on that journey, but less confident that she spoke to someone on the phone or not. They've actually got Gaynor's mobile phone and they're going through those records to try and get some more information, Rosanna. It certainly seems like they're piecing together more and more every day. We keep getting, you know, more CCTV and the like. I mean, in terms of what we've heard from her family, have they spoken at all? So nothing official from the family. The son, I know, spoke to Gaynor's sister-in-law, the wife of Gaynor's husband, who, who reported that Gaynor's husband is in bits at the moment. I know her family, her three children, are being... Uh, dealt with and comforted by specialist officers at what must be a very distressing time. We also know Gaynor's daughter, Alexandra, reposted one of Norfolk Constabulary's, uh, Constabulary's messages over the weekend, asking for more information on Facebook and just to say, uh, please, if anyone has any more information, please, please come through and let us know. And if they do, excuse me, excuse me, mate, sorry. Sorry, Rosanna, we're in the centre of Norwich. Right, He's uh, yeah. got his own difficulties. But as yeah. I say, the, the police are appealing for as much information. Uh, 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 you know, if anyone can get in touch with them over the phone, please do. That's what they tell me. That's all right, Nick. Look, you are standing in a town centre. I think if the boys knew what you were talking about this evening, they perhaps wouldn't be uh, doing what they're doing, but they're young kids. We can, of course, understand that. Uh, look, Nick, thank you very much for giving us that update this evening. We appreciate that. We know you're staying across this story and we'll come back to you. Well, next tonight, it's an early Christmas present for Rishi Sunak. Another by-election on the horizon. And yes, it's because another Tory MP is facing a suspension for bad behaviour. Scott Benton, in this case, caught in a Times investigation offering to lobby ministers for cash. 
Now the House of Commons Standing Committee has handed him a 35-day suspension from Parliament. So as long as MPs agree with the punishment, his voters in Blackpool South will be given the chance to kick him out. The Spectator's political correspondent, James Hill, joins me now, James. And I mean, there was a point in time, James, where by-election, the potential by-election, would have been headline news and dominating everything. There's now been so many threats of such and actual examples of such that it seems to be a bit of a bit part story today. Well, quite. I feel like it's a Brenda from Bristol, you know, not another one. Um, at these news, I mean, at the start of this parliament, it was a long period. It was the longest period in history in the post-war era where we didn't have any by-elections whatsoever. And really, in the past 18 months or so, it's been death by by-election for Rishi Sunak. I think in this case, uh, Scott Benton, obviously, it's going through the Standards Commission process. Uh, it's going to be going to a petition recall. Uh, but it looks very likely, if history has anything to go by, we're going to have a, uh, a by-election here. Uh, and this one, really, it was because of an undercover sting by the Times newspaper. Um, and as soon as the revelations were made, uh, you know, the, he lost the whip, Scott Benton. But I don't think that's going to save him at all. And I think the Tories are going to get a real kicking in this by-election as and when it's held next year. Now, just in case our viewers didn't see the Times exclusive, it was quite extraordinary what Scott Benton was allegedly promising these reporters. Just remind us of what actually went down in that meeting. Well, it was the allegation that he was uh, willing to do uh, lobbying ministers for cash. And um, basically what the Times did was they would talk to him, they targeted a number of different MPs, uh, and they managed to record him talking about the ways in which he was able to influence ministers if he took on a paid a uh, paid role. Um, and he was sort of caught boasting about different ways in which the rules worked. The fact that, you know, there's a minimum amount you had to declare and you could declare under that in order to go with hospitality. Uh, and really, I think what's come out today is the Standards Commission's report has been really rather damning, uh, including things such as, you know, Scott, Scott Benton claimed that he was unable to, to think straight because it, it was a very loud place in which this meeting was conducted. Actually, uh, he was heard on camera actually talking about how quiet and peaceful it was uh, for a meeting. So, um, yeah, I think it's really a sense of talking to Tory MPs tonight. They all think, well, it's hardly a surprise. We expected this one. And even in normal times for a good majority government with a good majority, they'd expect to lose the seats because it's less than 4,000 majority. Given the way the polls look now, Rosanna, I think that the Tories could expect a real uh, Labour swing here and winning it by about, you know, solid uh, five figures. The last thing they needed when they were that far behind the polls. In fact, we do have a clip of the moment Scott Benson was caught up by reporters. Let's take a listen. We vote in House Commons two or three times a day. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be voting later. Um, you will literally stand at the beginning, at the entrance to the voting lobby, and if you wait there for five minutes, the minister has mm -hmm. to pass you, mm -hmm. and then you've got ten minutes while you walk around to the next boat mm -hmm. to have his ear. What sort of, uh, I mean, do, you have, do you have a figure in mind? What, what sort of conversation would you be looking for? Um, I will leave that to you. <laughs> <laughs> We miss me to take I mean, we were thinking probably in the range of two to four thousand pounds a month, um, but um, I don't know if that sounds in the right ballpark. Um, yes, I think yes. Yeah. I mean, it is. It's it's right out there. Uh, there's no hiding it. It's him, and he's saying that, James. And you know, MPs having second jobs and or lobbying and getting involved in this type of thing. I think a lot of the public don't realise how much of this goes on. How much of selling access? Uh, you know, do you think this is really going to tarnish the reputation further of the Conservative Party, if possible? Well, I mean, the Conservatives already pretty got low in the polls, you know, 25, 26 uh, percent. And it does seem a little bit like the 1990s again, when there was all the allegations of a sleaze around. I, I think in this case, to offer a partial defence, as soon as the allegations were made public by the Times, he, he got suspended, lost the whip. Unlike, say, for instance, where there was the Chris Pincher scandal last year, which finally did for Boris Johnson, uh, there were elements to that about uh, did the party know about these allegations? Did the party in any way kind of overlook them? With this, it was a simple case, lost the whip. But having gone through the parliamentary process, uh, he lost it. And it's one of those things where you could be prime minister and do everything yourself right. But when you've got 350 men and women, often they're doing all sorts, uh, although they're rarely, I have to say, as stupid as Scott Benton and getting caught in the manner that he did. Sorry, I shouldn't laugh. I mean, uh, just James, um, work with me here. Do you think if we paid MPs more, if they were deserving of that, uh, they wouldn't be so tempted to do this type of thing? Or do you think they'd still do it anyway? Gosh, well, that's an interesting question about human nature there, Rosanna. I think the point at which MPs wouldn't need to have uh, any financial worries, you'd be at a, a level of stupid compensation. Uh, 
Uh, the reality is there'll always be some MPs who who get caught out by stings like this. Uh, I would just say in their defence that the majority are pretty decent uh, men and women. And uh, it's certainly a role I wouldn't want to do, even if they were paying me an extra four grand on the side. Yeah, I often think the same thing. James Hill, the political correspondent of The Spectator. Thank you. Well, next year on Primetime, we'll be asking, does the chainsaw-wielding Argentinian president known as El Loco have the right idea when it comes to economic policy? Find out after the break. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this is important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you discussion can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. Last month, the world watched in somewhat shock as Argentina elected its new president. The shaggy-haired, chainsaw-wielding TV celebrity turned libertarian politician Javier Millet, also known as El Loco, on election, he pledged a radical economic overhaul to curb what he's labelled the country's biggest crisis. Details of these proposals are now starting to emerge, with Argentina's economy minister, Luis Caputo, warning this week there is no money left. The result is that spending is to be slashed by almost 3% of GDP. Energy and transport subsidies are out and half of the government's ministries will be shut down. Most astonishing of all, the peso will be devalued by 54%, taking it closer to its black market value, meaning 800 pesos will be equal to one US dollar. But this so-called chainsaw economics has won the approval of the IMF. So rather than making fun of it, should we all be taking note? Joining me to discuss this, editor-in-chief of the Buenos Aires Times, James Granger. James, thanks for joining us, because, you know, we look at this through the slant, obviously, of a British-based um, 
news channel. We broadcast internationally as well. But, you know, not many people think about Argentinian economics on a daily basis in the UK, I think it's fair to say. Uh, but some interesting parallels can be drawn between our economy and Argentina and various other economies. Javier Miller has some very extreme ideas for fixing it. Walk us through. Well, uh, thanks for having me, first of all. I think, uh, I, you know, you went through a lot of the policies yourself there. I mean, they are quite radical. It's one of the biggest kind of adjustments that we have had and uh, one of the largest group of austerity measures that we've had in, uh, in a very long time. Uh, but really, the economy is in a very bad shape. There is a, a massive problem with inflation, which is running at 160 per, 160 per cent this year at the moment over the last 12 months and just 12.8 percent in the last month alone. So we are projected to have lots more of that. And I'm not sure that this plan is necessarily going to stop inflation, but it's uh, definitely an orthodox plan. And a lot of economists uh, are quite in favor of it and think that it's time to have something dramatic like this happen to Argentina's economy. When uh, we saw some of the campaign antics of Javier Mille, when he was talking about taking a chainsaw to the ministries and kind of getting rid of them, he was pulling uh, stickers off a whiteboard and saying, we don't need that, we don't need that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. that's the idea of cutting down on big government, which a lot of libertarians can sure. uh, kind of agree with. Um, does any yeah. of that concern you, that it will be a bit of a blunt measure? I mean, yes, I, I think from a social aspect, there are lots of problems that could be created like this. Uh, you know, there's no talks about reopening wage negotiations or what's going to happen to salaries. And Argentina has, uh, you know, a long history of public demonstrations and protests. It's a very active kind of a political country, if you like. Uh, and I think there's real problems in that respect. The, the, the lady who was uh, Millet's former, former rival in the presidential campaign is going to take over the security ministry and she's about to uh, give a speech in about an hour or so, vowing that all street blockades will be broken down and everything else. But I think the real problem here is poverty, right? Poverty affects uh, roughly 40% of the country at the moment. Private estimates put that way higher. Uh, it obviously is going to jump after these measures, after the latest devaluation. Uh, and I think there's real problems, you know, that people that are living in poverty at the moment are going to find it increasingly hard to, uh, to get by, especially if you're cutting things like energy and transport subsidies which they rely on so much. You know, the price of a bus fare here is, you know, something like 0 0.3 US cents. So it really is uh, a really low fee. But, you know, if you're if you're in a low paid job and taking three buses to work every day, that's a real challenge on your, you know, your daily economy. Do you then predict that there could be some form of protest or unrest as a result of some of this? I mean, it would really surprise me if Argentina did not go that way, because I think that's uh, what tends to happen here quite a lot you know i think uh, i think it was two or three years ago there was a local observatory and they recorded five thousand protests in buenos aires in just a year so i think there's a you know there's a there's a strong uh, element that will uh, you know want to demand that these changes are righted and that they are uh, you know that the people that are really in the lower classes that that it, the, the kind of ajuste as they call it here the austerity doesn't hit them so hard um, but I think, you know, the government has vowed to block all those and, and ensure that business can carry on as usual. Uh, you know, when that comes to a head, we'll, we'll have to see, I'm afraid. Now he's been inaugurated and he's, he's early on sure. in the job. We have yet to see uh, how mm -hmm. things are going to pan out. But in terms of the types of relationships he might build internationally, it's quite interesting mm -hmm. to watch. You know, we saw Zelensky there, obviously. Um, you know, sure. people are kind of speculating where will he be when it comes to the US election and who might be in office there? Is he potentially more of a Trumpite, for example? We are seeing a resurgence yes. of some libertarian and populist politics ideas across Europe at the moment. Do you get a sense mm -hmm. of where um, Millet sits on people, personalities and international relationships? I mean, sure, it's, it's pretty clear what he wants to do. He, he wants his first trip to be to Israel. He is someone who reads the Torah in his spare time. In his spare time, he's not converted, but he's uh, uh, very okay with the Jewish with the Jewish faith. Uh, he's a big fan of the U.S. Obviously, uh, Trump has been someone who he he's spoken of very positively in the past. The same with Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil. But what we have seen actually since he's taken office uh, is a lot of his officials on his trip to to Washington after he won the election. Sorry, before he took office, uh, he went to meet with uh, former President uh, Bill Clinton and uh, met with a lot of officials from the Biden administration. And I think there is, um, you know, uh, perhaps a shift there. Ideologically, perhaps you could say he's closer to Trump. But we've seen a lot of pragmatism from Malay in the last few days. A lot of the extreme things that he proposed during the campaign, like dynamiting the central bank or uh, dollarizing the economy, are really not possible. Uh, 
uh, in Congress, he's a very weak force. He has seven out of 72 senators and I, uh, I think 40 lawmakers out of 257. So he's going to have to form allies. And he's, gonna, he's at the moment presenting a plan that is very orthodox and far less extreme, uh, radical than he initially promoted. But I think those ties that you were talking about before, I mean, we had visitors here as well, figures like uh, Viktor Orban. And obviously, like you say, Zelensky was a massive coup for him. Uh, and Millet is keen to have a Latin American summit uh, for Ukraine, which he brings a lot of countries together and unifies their position. James Granger, Editor-in-Chief at Buenos Aires Times. Thanks so much for making time. No worries. Thanks for having me. Well, next year on the show, I'm going to be joined by my panel on this Thursday night. We're going to go over some other headlines, including whether Neanderthal genes are the reason you're a morning person. Stay with us. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in yeah. three years. Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back. Time now for our primetime panel to dissect some other big stories from the day. Joining me in the studio, commentator Jana Jarju and conservative commentator Alex Dean. Thank you both. Hello. First to hop, the Bank of England has held interest rates today at 5.25%. That's the third time in a row it's decided to leave the rate, which is the highest of 15 years, unchanged. Governor Andrew Bailey saying he cannot not say definitively whether inflation had peaked and that it's too soon to start thinking about cutting interest rates. Perhaps most telling, though, is the vote itself. Three people on the Monetary Policy Committee voted for further hikes and six voted to hold. 
So let's talk all things money. Bank of England, sometimes you think, well, it's a bit, you know, dry, but actually it affects us all at the moment, these high interest rates. Mortgages, we're seeing people defaulting on their mortgages. It's everything to do with borrowing. And of course, this is in a bid to get runaway inflation down. Criticisms, though, often levied, Joanna, at the Bank of England, whether or not they've really got a good handle on things. What do you think? Well, I mean, obviously, from a normal person's point of view, you kind of don't care whether they're doing a good job or not, you're looking at your um, bills and how that actually translates. So from their point of view, they'll be saying, well, we're going in hard basically because we want to get inflation down. But really you're thinking about the bills that you're getting through your letterbox. Mm. Um, I think that, you know, for the Bank of England, Overall, when we look at other um, European countries, obviously we're not in recession. There's other European countries that are in a worse um, economic state. I think, I guess, the fact that inflation's going down means that they are, they are doing a relatively good job. However, it gets to a point where the average Joe will be saying, give us a break, you know? We've just seen a massive dip in um, inflation. When will it be time, basically? Mm. I think everybody is kind of watching uh, the clock and um, hoping that they'll realise that we're in a cost of living crisis, their decisions do make um, a difference to people's lives and it's about time that they have more of a, I guess, wider view of the effects of the decisions that they're making. And it is just that tipping point though between higher inflation and when inflation started spiking, everyone was like, crikey, the price of butter has just gone up 10%. So in order to get that down, you've got to have, it's, just, it's a strange concept, but this uh, lever, which is a high interest rate. Mm -hmm. But it, again, it's hard to communicate that. And you can understand people's frustrations. Alex, especially if they're trying to get a mortgage for the first time. Sure, when interest rates are as they are, many people have been watching, hoping for a cut. That this uh, MP's Monetary Policy uh, Committee decision indicates a cut is some way away. Some members of the committee think that uh, rates should still go up again. Um, it's important to remember that when inflation falls, prices don't fall, they just rise more slowly. Mm -hmm. That's the uh, difference that some people might not uh, quite grasp. It doesn't mean that suddenly prices are going to drop again. Mm -hmm. It means that the rate at which they increase has slowed. Your question was, have they got a good grasp on things? I actually think they are trying to take a broad view and they're trying to do what they think is for the best interest of the country. It's a tough balancing act, right? Because they want to get inflation under control, but they don't want to go too hard and tip us into recession. And as you were saying, plenty of our competitor economies are already there or thereabouts. So you know, it's not easy for them. I personally would rather these decisions were still in the hands of government. It's a very I'm unfashionable view these days. Absolutely not. <laughs> Go on, Joanna, why not? Absolutely not. I think it's um, one of the things that I feel quite strongly about is the Bank of England being independent, whether they're doing a good job, you know, depending on who you ask or not. Um, I think especially looking at the current government that we've got, you know, one of Rishi Sunak's goals, apart from everything else that he's failing on, is um, growth. And I think that, yeah. you know, this is the type of thing that this Tory government would tweak and in you know, their favour, and you know that wouldn't necessarily be... What you get to do when you don't like the government is vote against it. You can never do that with an independent bank. You can never say, I want to kick this lot of bums out and I want to elect another lot of bums in. And at least with people who are elected, they are ultimately accountable to you. It's very fashionable to say, let's give this institution to experts, but you'll find that oligarchy, that people, that set of people you appoint to that thing, will never be a removable uh, by you again. Once you've given that away, you never, generally never get it back. I hear your point about oligarchy. My counter to that, I wonder, uh, well, I'm happy with having a room full of economists deciding how best for the economy in this country to go. A monetary policy committee made up of financial experts and economists who know a lot more about money than I do, sure. a lot more about economics. Those experts can, of course, provide advice, but there's a reason that politicians oversee our health service and our education service. On your basis, you would have a bunch of doctors who are supreme commanders of the health system and a bunch of teachers who are supreme commander of the education system. And in the end, your ability to vote people in or out would count for nothing. Mm. But if you, if, sorry, Go on. If, if you look at, um, at the moment, apart from, I mean, the government are focusing anyway on all the things that they shouldn't be. The thing that's going to decide the next election is going to be the economy. So would you also want somebody who can, you know, tinker things and change things to be able to benefit them rather would, than actually looking at the long-term view of what the country needs? I accept that the cost of somebody being in an elected position is that sometimes they'll do things badly and the mm. benefit is that you can vote them out rather than having them self-perpetuating forever in their position of power. What do you make, uh, just briefly, I want to know, Alex, of um, the government taking credit for halving inflation? 
They're entitled to some of the credit for that. They're entitled <laughs> to some of the credit because, of course, government is the largest single spender of money in the UK, right? So it's not it's a non-trivial aspect of e mm, economic yeah. activity. But they're not entitled to a, a lot of it because it's to do with broader economic activity around mm. the world. But they, what they are better, in my view, entitled to do is point to other major nations, other Western liberal democracies who've already been into recession in 2023 and say, look, we've done better than them. That may be thin gruel in an environment that is uh, <laughs> that is high tax and low growth. Mm. But you know what? That's another problem for the Bank of England. That's the kind of death spiral it's very hard to get out of. Another bowl of gruel, please, sir. Let's move on to US politics, shall we, and uh, cleanse our palate with some of that. But it is looking pretty gruelly over there as well at the moment. The US House of Representatives has voted to formally open an impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden, moving forward a process that's been promised by Republican leaders since they regained control of the lower chamber in midterm elections in 2022. Now, although no evidence has actually been produced yet, Republicans have accused the president of personally benefiting from his son Hunter Biden's overseas business dealings. This was under the prior administration. So what is happening? Could the president be convicted? I mean, Joanna, at this point, we're so used to hearing about Trump being impeached that do you think people are getting numb to the idea of a president being impeached full stop? Um... I actually think a lot of people won't have seen this come in. And I was um, thinking before the show that this is really not on brand <laughs> for um, for Joe Biden. I don't think it's on brand for the, Democrat, the Democrats at all or any kind of left party. I think, you know, if we had something similar here in the UK and you heard that, you know, Keir Starmer was going through some sort of tax scandal, for example, you wouldn't think that was on brand for him. You would think maybe that was more on brand for somebody like Rishi Sunak. Um, and I think that, you know, this is pure politics, I think, to be honest, from uh, the Republican Party. I don't think that there'll be enough to catch um, Biden, but I think that there'll be enough from a political perspective, because this will probably, you know, overspill into um, the election trail for them. But, I mean, this is... The points Joanna raises there, Alex, um, are key here, because this is what we're talking about at the moment. The US, uh, with all the trials against Trump, his party, his supporters, are all saying it's lawfare. It's a witch yeah. hunt. It's a political witch hunt against him. So this is retribution impeachment. Impeachment it? in the US has become a political tool. And many of Trump's defenders will say, well, yeah, that's what you did to our president. But you know, two wrongs don't make a right. I would point out there is simply no chance of this impeachment procedure succeeding. Democrats have an outright majority in the Senate, and so it won't actually get over the hurdle where it matters. But that's not what they're playing at. Mm -hmm. What they're playing at is an environment where you can sling mud. And let's mm -hmm. agree one thing. Whatever Hunter Biden has done or hasn't done, he's hardly a net asset to his <laughs> father here. Yeah, I mean, well, the, just the name Hunter Biden now invokes all of this uh, concern over impropriety. And when you look at what they've been investigating, it was that during the time of the previous administration, he was using his connection to his father to kind of open doors. And he was doing business that involved China, unquestionably, right. and other places as well. Whether or not they find enough evidence that there was wrongdoing and that Joe Biden was aware of that, at the moment seems scant, but we'll have to wait and see. But what they're really doing is they are delaying this and, and hoping that this gets dragged out until 2024, uh, through 2024, when there is going to be a US election, aren't they? Because it, it's going to hamper the chances of Joe Biden being re-elected. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I agree. And I think that, you know, if they have opportunity to subpoena certain people, I think just the embarrassment, yeah. I think that they're, they're kind of trying to use that as, um, you know, uh, something against Joe Biden. And if you can kind of embarrass him, put all his family on the stand, whoever, I think it will be enough um, for them to kind of use that as an election strategy for sure. It'll definitely be embarrassing. I, I agree with that. Um, they would say the point of the investigation is to get uh, further evidence. And so don't ask us for it yet. The Machiavellian interpretation is to say, if you did have some, you wouldn't bring it out yet. <laughs> You'd wait until you're in the election campaign. Yeah, yeah and uh, we, it's something we know about politics. It's Machiavellian, and things can be used at any opportunity. It does make me wonder whether we have seen an era like this in politics for quite some time, in terms of where we are, uh, what we were reporting on earlier with the lobbying scandal, the latest one, the Conservatives in the UK, and then what's happening stateside as well at the moment. But we will stay posted for that all of next year. Moving on now, finally, I want to ask you this. Are you a morning person? Well, Neanderthal DNA could be the reason why. A new study finds that many of these genes affect the body clock, increasing propensity to be a morning person. Uh, so just using this as an example to talk to you both about your personal lives and when you go to bed and how you feel in the morning when you wake up, because I know for so sure I am not a morning person. Are you, Joe? Absolutely not. Joanna? Yeah. I could be having the best time of my life and 
just, you know, when people say, oh, do something that you love that will get you out of bed in the morning. I could be doing my dream job, but I would still find it hard to, uh, and this is my dream job, partly. Um, it, I would still find it hard to um, drag myself out of bed on a morning. It's just not me at all. What about you, Alex? My wife is expecting the new year, so I'm preparing to be a morning person, whether I want to be or not. <laughs> Congratulations on that. Now, talking about um, morning person or not, there is some serious science behind this. I actually once interviewed a neuroscientist on stage who examined chronotypes, which is the type of person you are, whether you are a morning bird or a night owl, there's different terms of that. And also the detrimental health effects that can be gotten from working night shifts. At the time I was overnighting as a news anchor and he turned to me on stage and said, my goodness, you're going to die young. And I thought, oh, you know, and the whole audience oh gasped as well, because whether or not you're pushing against your body type or not really has a huge impact on your well-being. I'm definitely not a morning person like you, Joanna. I like to get up at about 9.30 in the morning and I sometimes think, oh my goodness, you know, am I, that's a, a bit lazy of me. But you should work with your body type. It also means, according to the study, that I'm likely not a Neanderthal. Yeah. <laughs> Because what they're looking at is where your genes came from. I mean, Alex, when you saw this, did you think uh, that makes sense? Neanderthals would have got up with the crack of dawn? Well, it makes sense because they didn't have artificial light. Uh, but, <laughs> but I was, and that's what's interfered with our, our sleeping patterns. Another part of history suggests that we used to sleep biphasically, two different uh, bits, and we would have a time in the dead of night when we would wake up for a while and... And, and spend time talking to people or fraternising. And, and that's gone away because the advent of artificial light meant we could extend the day and now we sleep in one big block. And there, so there are people who advocate going back to that two blocks of sleep time. But, you know, I was in the States last week and when I'm in back on the time clock, I, I get up later and I feel better as a, as a result of that. So maybe I'm like you. Maybe I should get up at 9.30, but I'm not sure my employer would really approve of it. Uh, bring back nap times. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> Joanna and Alex, you've been good sports this evening. Thank you. It's all we've got time for tonight on Prime Time. Thank you for watching. Piers Very good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Feltz, every weekday at 4 p.m. only on Talk, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. We're here! Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan...